Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ambassador, <coughs> other chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and their friends in McGill, and particularly Joe Mulholland. My, my opening thesis is a pretty stark one. Democracy is not the norm. If by democracy we mean a form of government based on universal suffrage and respect for human rights, yet we behave as if it is, and I think that's a great mistake. For in terms of human experience, democracy is the exception, and of such recent origin that is not even the skin on the apple of history. In 1900, there wasn't a single democracy on the globe. No country had yet given the vote to women, nor to men under a certain age, nor to those below a particular property threshold. For some minorities, the right to vote was a cruel fiction. Those with the right to vote were a privileged minority within the total population. Governments were aristocratic, in most cases autocratic, and civil rights were more constricted uh, and often denied. In the main, they were simply window dressing on autocratic regimes. Government of the people, by the people, for the people, all of the people, was an exception. For example, of the 51 founder members of the United Nations in 1945, only 15 could credibly be described as democracies, and the remainder either as autocracies, theocracies, or dictatorships. So as a form of government, democracy is a newcomer that arrived late on the scene in Europe. The last of the di dictatorships, we should remind ourselves, only disappeared in the 1980s. Of the 28 member states of the European Union, 18 were dictatorships at one point during the 20th century. 11 suffered from, European, from Russian domination and seven from homegrown fascism. Most had endured multiple forms of tyranny and or military occupation. 11 had been part of a great empire as we had been here in Ireland. Few of the member states finished the century with the same boundaries as they had begun. Most had been changed, in some cases substantially, and in all such instances by force. Throughout the 20th century, national boundaries proved to be what you might call malleable, flexible, fluid, elastic, you might say, as they always had been. And moreover, the displacement of peoples in the 20th century and mass migrations in Europe were as great as any other period in history. And if the modern era began with the Industrial Revolution, say 250 years ago, a mass democracy based on universal suffrage and respect for human rights has been in existence only for about 100 years. Hence, as a, as a, as a form of organization, it is not even, as I said earlier, the skin on the apple, and is still in a state of infancy. So the depiction of contemporary Europe as a zone of long-established democracies with settled populations and stable societies and boundaries is grievously misleading. It is a myth and a dangerous one at that because it can lead to mistaken diagnosis of contemporary problems and hence to the wrong remedies. Of course democracy is presently under attack but the current fashion for strong leaders and populist movements based on nationalism, nourished by xenophobia and reeking of racial hatred, is not a departure from the historic norm and hence a cause for alarm. Rather, it is a reversion to the historic norm. And that's the real cause for alarm. And if so, it suggests a remedy that goes beyond those currently on offer. And this presentation will conclude by outlining one. So, so given their relative novelty as a form of political organization, mass democracies are difficult to construct, to organize, and to manage. And the basic problem, once they have been created, is threefold. Representation, communication, and legitimation. <coughs> 
Now, representation, as you immediately can see, is the trickiest, as Burke outlined in his famous address to the electors of Bristol. And while the majority of EU member states are, have populations of under 10 million and so could be classified as small, even with those numbers, it is impossible to practice direct democracy. And that would be even truer of the medium-sized or larger member states. Direct democracy is a utopian rather than a workable system, even though it is very fashionable to believe otherwise. And that leaves indirect or direct or representative democracy as the only viable political system, both plebiscitary democracy and, and democracy based on digital technologies, no more than the latest fads to distract us from the real issue. So to, to, to state the obvious about the problem, mass democracies have to be structured around elected representatives sitting in national legislatures, which in turn appoint executives and that is the nature of the beast. And within this system, political parties are indispensable both as mass organizations and as, as the parliamentary groupings on which governments are based. Experience proves that democracy cannot function if it is centered around tiny factions, individuals, or so-called independents, as that is the route to anarchy. So the centrality of parties and are, will be taken up later in this particular presentation. So the logic of the line of reasoning up to, up to the present leads to a very inconvenient uh, truth. And it is this, that representative democracy has an inbuilt contradiction, which at worst may prove its undoing, and at best will lead to periodic crises, sometimes causing great disruption. The problem arises from the unavoidable contradiction, which in normal terms, normal times, is manageable. But these aren't normal times. It originates with the problems of communication that ultimately affect legitimacy. It's, a, it's a, a, an anomaly that the inherent strength of, of a collective executive is, is its legitimacy, which it derives from free elections. But that strength also gives rise to an inherent weakness caused by the psychological gap between the governing and the governed. And notwithstanding their use of TV and social media, public representatives are always open to the charge that they are remote from the electorate and out of touch with their needs. Charges uh, that are leveled with particular vehemence when they appear as candidates at election time. And the inevitable distance between the elected and the electorate is normally bridged by the social contract based on trust and transparency, whereby the governed, and this is the key point, consent to being governed because the system is generally seen as being benign and broadly equitable. And the prevalence of consent is the bedrock on which the whole democratic evidence rests. In democracy, the executive branch governs in autocracies, it rules, and the difference is not just semantic. But the social contract, on which everything depends, can be broken by government failure to anticipate, prevent, or solve crises, by manifest inequality, by corruption, or more frequently by the inability of government to explain the complexity of the democratic process and the difficulty of arriving at acceptable trade-offs, say, between the level of taxation and the level of expenditure. And it's sort of incomprehension caused by government failure or by its inability most of the time to communicate, which leaves democracies open to demagogic attack. Even in the tiny Greek politics, the demagogue could destroy democracy as frequently do did and as Aristotle testifies in his great work on politics. The problem is that those who govern are automatically, axiomatically, an elite. That's unavoidable. At its politest, it gives rise to what might be called the Dublin Four syndrome, and elsewhere as the bubble, and leads inexorably to a crisis of legitimacy if mishandled. <clears throat> 
Uh, the acid eroding the base on which democracy rests is currently that elites are distrusted simply because they are elites. And not only distrusted, but derided by political outsiders who promised to drain the swamp. And not only derided, but despised by opponents in the social media who are vowed to destroy them. And not only despised, but denounced by the conventional media who have become what Steve Richards in his book, The Rise of the Outsiders, calls the real opposition. Now, given that the social contract was shredded by the economic depression, caused by the financial and not by the political system, be it said, it was inevitable that what many saw as the betrayal of a sacred trust would lead to a political insurrection, fueled by anger, which still burns, especially in this country, and which rightly burns at what Ben Bernanke described as the worst financial crisis in the history of the globe, including that of the Great Depression. Now, insurgent politics is nothing new. The great Maurice Duverger, the political theorist and also a parliamentarian, outlined a half a century ago his thesis that political parties generally replace each other in a sort of Darwinian struggle for survival and supremacy. The rise of social democratic parties in Europe before the First World War is one of the great examples as it refashioned the political system of the 19th century. But as at this very moment, they are themselves being replaced by a different form of mass party, one based on identity rather than class. And within the last five years, this phenomenon has been confirmed by, for example, the disappearance of the Parti Socialiste in France and by the Christian Democratic Party in Italy, to name but a few. And there's no shortage of examples, and I, nor, I believe, of candidates for the chopping block. But the process of change has itself undergone change, profound change this past decade, with the advent of two things. First, social media, and secondly, the emergence of immigration as a core issue. To start with social media, to state the obvious, it's clear that by their very nature, they have accelerated the speed of change by eliminating entry barriers to electoral politics because they provide instant communication, universal access to the electorate, and cost-free organizational tools. From a logistical perspective, the entry barriers to electoral politics which had been formidable and sometimes insuperable, have virtually disappeared. Consequently, new forms of political organization spring up overnight for which, against which representative democracies are ill-equipped. By and large, the representative democracies suffer from the fact that their structures are too cumbersome, their leaderships too diffuse, and their appeal too insipid, and critically, their campaigning style no match for confrontation based on highly charged abuse, personal vilification, and outright lies. And the most obvious re weakness in a, in, a, in a representative democracy is that the incumbents play by the rules, by the rule book, and the insurgents tear up the book and play by no rules other than their own. And this discrepancy is exacerbated if the insurgency is supported by mainline media, as it was by TV in the case of Trump, and by the tabloids in the case of Brexit. If it is led by a demagogue and propelled by social media manipulating big data. But the demagogue is the key, as Aristotle said, and when let loose, changes the game completely as is evident at the moment in public discourse. Political, just think of it, political debate even at the beginning of this century, less than 20 years ago, was conducted under unspoken but universally accepted rules. Self-imposed restraint, civility in dealing with your opponents, common courtesy, moderation in language and dress, respect for experts and expertise, regards for tradition and custom, 
and above all, acceptance of the rule of law and the constraints that it, that it imposes even on the highest. Now, we know this to be generally true because these behavioral norms have already been undermined to the point of disappearing in the United States, or are in the process of disappearing in many parts of Europe, such as in Italy, Hungary, and may I dare say, the United Kingdom. And political debate is now toxic and a reminder of the truism that you don't know the value of something until it's lost. And indisputably, there has been a fundamental change in the conduct of politics with the squieting echoes of the 1930s, particularly the re-emergence of racial politics, uh, which brings me to the second game changer, that of immigration. In reflecting uh, on his five years as President of the European Council, the first such to occupy the post, Hermann von Rompuy said that immigration was the crucial issue in the future of Europe. But he wondered as to why mainstream politicians didn't discuss it. Yet it's obvious that the, alongside the Great Depression, that immigration is the twin cause of populism more insidious than economic depression because it poisons public discourse, more threatening because it unleashes the worst demons of our nature to misquote Lincoln. It gives rise to the strong man or strong woman who goes on to build xenophobic parties repeating the rhetoric and the behavior of fascism. And despite the lessons of the 1930s, these xenophobic parties have recently exploded in strength, even in what might be regarded as the heartlands of the European Union, the Netherlands, France, Germany, and Italy. Ominously, some of them are in office, and they may well dominate the European Parliament about to be elected. And if so, that would lead to a constitutional crisis in the EU by pitting the Parliament against the European Council, or perhaps the crisis will be within the European Council, which will be paralyzed as Italy recently threatened to do. So the political repercussions of immigration have been profoundly negative, striking at the heart of the European project. The preamble, for example, of the, European, of the Lisbon Treaty refers to the antithesis of nationalism. It refers to fostering solidarity between the peoples of Europe and of drawing them closer together. But any sense of solidarity, weak and all as it was, has been the first victim of immigration. And, as a, and, and a complementary casualty has been that solidarity normally present within societies with the emergence of what you might call super patriots claiming to be the only true representative of their country and culture the true Finns syndrome, denouncing the rest as traitors, and sometimes the expression enemies of the people is used. Now, these super patriots are, of course, simply a latter-day variant of old-fashioned nationalism, fueled as always by a lethal combination of hatred, fanaticism, and what Yeats called passionate intensity. So for, for that reason, the organizers of this summer school have warned that Europe is now threatened within and without by extremist ideologies, aggressive regimes, and the rejection of democracy itself. That insight, together with this analysis, brings us back to the opening argument that contemporary society is reverting to the historic norm of the strong leader, authoritarianism, disrespect for human rights, and disregard for the rule of law. To me, that is the real cause for alarm, as, well, as I argued at the outset. And this historic norm is heightened by the scale of immigration and its potential to swamp Europe if the African population explosion is not contained within the next two decades. Perhaps that's the reason why politicians avoid discussing it. But it's a separate issue for another day. Now, to conclude, politics, as the organizers claim, is indeed under attack. But I fear it will not be preserved unless Democrats recognize that the post-war political system 
is being replaced by a new order in which the battle lines are being drawn up between those who believe in the values on which democracy is based and those who don't. And class is no longer the real cause of cleavage within society. The new reality will have profound repercussions for the structure of the party system. Simply put, there is no longer any sustainable rationale <coughs> or justification for the separate existence of social democratic and Christian democratic parties. What they have in common is more important than what divides them. At base, they are Democrats, as their names testify. And if democracy is to be saved from attack, they will have to coalesce around their common allegiance to the values on which Europe was founded, rather than continuing as opponents in an outmoded struggle. If that is accepted, it follows that existing parties are redundant. And I say this as the former General Secretary of a political party in the full knowledge of what I am saying. The parties that were fashioned a, a century ago, as mine was, are, are being consigned to the dustbin of history, to quote Trotsky, and sad but true. And the realignment of the democratic forces is the only way to the fell, this repel populism, and failure to do so is going to be a sure guarantee of defeat. Now, it's obvious that realignment is going to occur either voluntarily or by force. Voluntarily, unlikely, because uh, logic doesn't always prevail when what's at stake is power and position. In that case, it will be imposed on the existing parties by a new force, as already happened in France. <clears throat> and the victory of uh, La République en Marche not only confirms the speed with which change can take place, but also the point that one person, marked out by fate, can alter the course of history, sometimes uh, at a stroke. Macron made it happen and built a political movement in, that may well endure in France. We don't know what the rest of Europe will do. But look at what, has hap what is now happening. We have centrists confronted by liberal de democrats, populists, who are allied to the extreme right and, to, and with the extreme left. And that's a pretty formidable opposition and sufficient cause to force Democrats everywhere to reflect on their responsibilities and on the outmoded differences of second order importance that divide them, and instead of which they should unite around issues of first order importance, that is the preservation of democracy. The Schumann Declaration was made at a moment of great danger. It began with the statement that world peace could not be safeguarded without the making of creative and efforts proportionate to the dangers that confronted it. The same is true, Mr. Chairman, I would allege, in respect of the dangers that currently threaten Europe today. The action taken must be proportionate to the challenge we face right now. Think if Schumann and Monet had not taken the initiative that they had, think of the Europe that we could have if the Union, European Union did not exist. Think of the historic mission of the European Union for which it gets very little recognition. Above all, it's so, uh, even greater than its social and economic achievements, the European Union has been the greatest democratic project in history, to quote John Hume. Let me conclude by saying that the case for a strong, united Europe has never been more pressing, the need to act never more compelling, and the cause never so grand. In an analogous situation a century ago, Yeats said that the best lacked all conviction, while the worst were full of passionate intensity, that the centre could not hold. This time, let Democrats prove that he was mistaken. Thank you.
Thank you.